Great, there we are. And we're being recorded, so that's good. We got all that together. I think I'm learning the learning how to do this now. So uh, uh, thanks for all the great questions everybody's been sending in. Um, definitely worth having a session for just to dive into these questions with you. I do want to make a little bit of announcement today, though, because um, I, I don't know if, if where it is and in, in how it's like where you are, but here in, in our section of California, there's been a big blowout of the um, Internet servers and AT&T, actually. Um, on their internet, and so uh, if uh, if you're one of those people that are trying to uh, Skype in, uh, we, well, we probably wouldn't be hearing you now. But anyway, uh, we will be uh, the recordings will be available, so that won't be lost. And I do make up a backup of the backup recording uh, through another system at the same time. So uh, so that's interesting. We had a complete. Uh, we can't get on the internet here at all. AT and T actually tried to tell us it might have something to do with the bombing in Boston. And I thought, well, that's a stretch. You know, that's a real stretch. Who knows? That's that conspiracy stuff, but we'll see. I think if they just haven't put much attention into their infrastructure, <laughs> we've had problems with them all the time anyway. So, um, so to get started today, I've um, uh, got a great bunch of questions here. I'm going to answer a few of the general questions first, and then we're going to get into what I think is one, going to be one of the more interesting uh, sessions here on um, past life regression, future progressions, and rescuing your lost self. Uh, we're going to get in some really good stuff on that today. Um, I have a question here, and this is in the general category, and I have a question here that I've been asked so many times um, in my life uh, since my near-death experience and when I do private sessions with people. It's a very, very good question uh, sent in by uh, Nathan. And um, his question is about... Uh, uh, um, Miscarriages and terminations, what happens, and, and, and those kind of things, you know, like abortions and things like that. And the people are always asking me out on the road, uh, am I pro-life or pro-choice? And I am pro-life and pro-choice. I, I believe we, we, I believe in life, but I also believe that a woman has 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 got to have the right to have a choice. Uh, that's all there is to it. And to answer the question is. Um, Miscarriages happen in nature, uh, but in the case of a miscarriage, uh, Nathan wants to know, uh, would, uh, uh, would the couples start a family with the same soul again? Would it boomerang back to the same family? Um, uh, very possible, but sometimes um, there wasn't the right connection and uh, best to let it go, so to speak. Uh, I know it's, it's a difficult thing to have, um, have this happen to a woman, uh, but sometimes it is for the best. And, um, and nature has a way of trying to do self-corrections, even though our minds and emotions may be uh, stuck. Um, the other thing is um, that, that affects us in an interesting way is what they call crib deaths or sudden, sudden infant death. Um, uh, as, as Light explained to me, uh, sudden infant death, and I was I was actually uh, a baby that had a sudden infant death uh, um, after I was born. And um, if you've ever read my story, you can kind of imagine why I came into a I came into a family that was having fist fights almost up to the minute I was being born. Um, but um, about uh, um, crib death or sudden infant death is um, uh, that is. Um, and I tried it, but they resuscitated me and brought me back. Um, but it is a um, it is something where um, a child or, or, or spirit comes into this and realizes that they can't take it. It isn't the right um, fit at all. And sometimes when it isn't the right fit at all, you're going to have miscarriages and other things happen, including sudden infant death. And we're very good at, at retrieving um, these children now and monitoring them. So, um, so you know, imagine how how much, how much this has happened in the past before we had technologies. But baby, but but it's it's uh, it's probably the last chance uh, a child has to do is say, I don't want to be here, and then they they die. I certainly didn't want to be here when I was born into this family. Um, I I just I, I thought, oh, this is not going to be good at all, and uh, I tried to uh, bail out, but they pulled me back. So um, it's very important to understand these things, that sometimes there's a nature, uh, and Gaia and the universe is beyond wisdom. Wisdom... Uh, 
as we humans speak, is really a human wisdom we're talking about. Uh, kind of a uh, interesting wisdom, uh, very uh, very narrow in its full spectrum. All, all, uh, although, because we we try to, especially in the modern science age, we try to look at everything intellectually. And uh, as I've said many times, uh, the universe is beyond intelligence, and that everything that we perceive from uh, emotions to spirituality to science is one band in a rainbow. And so if you're just stuck looking at the world through the spiritual lens, you'll see everything purple. If you're just stuck seeing everything from the root chakra, you'll see everything red and emotional. And, uh, and that's a narrow way to look at the whole universe. But Gaia and the universe is beyond our intelligence. And we are growing to begin to understand that uh, more and more so now than ever before. Now, the, this question of um, pro-life or pro-choice, this is a question I've been asked so many times by women in counseling and uh, because they, they feel guilty there's all kinds of emotions it's, uh, it's a very very serious thing and um, here's, here's what the light has told me because I never really thought about this until the, the first woman asked me about it and I, 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 asked, I had to ask the light about it um, the first thing the light teaches is that we do not create life, we do not destroy life, you cannot do that in this universe, it's like it's like um, destroying energy. You can't destroy it. it you, are, you are not actually taking a life. Um, what you're doing is um, changing a, a path and a pattern um, through abortion. And but but you are not technically uh, killing anyone. The spirit will move on to the next uh, right um, fit for it. And I, you know, whatever that fit is, some of us have these negative things we haven't worked out, and some of us are, are more positive. But the spirit will move on. You do not interrupt. Uh, you do not uh, kill anything that way. So don't don't think of yourself as as, uh, as being in that situation. The other thing to realize is that um, because there is real no death of energy, and we are definitely energy and an, and an intelligent form of energy as we know it, um, that includes uh, murders and things like that too. When someone is murdered, you they weren't actually killed. I mean, uh, uh, made to go extinct. The sad thing about these murders and things like that is that uh, you have interrupted someone's experience of life. You have interrupted an experience that will have to begin over. And who knows, um, like the children that were shot at the school and, and other things, how many of these uh, children, if their life had not been interrupted, would have grown up to be great mothers, great fathers, great brothers, or great scientists, or solve some major problem for the rest of us. And that is the real, real uh, deep tragedy of these things. And that is that is sad and serious and regretful, and uh, takes a long time to get over. But uh, in the end, even then, you're not depriving anyone from life, you're depriving them from the experience they began in life. And so uh, uh, this is why I cherish life, and this is why I am pro-life and pro-choice. So very good question, though. Get that, I ask that one so often. Now, um, <clears throat> next question is uh, from my friend uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, Pengai, and I usually say these names wrong. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, the question is very interesting, um, uh, uh, and, and, and uh, I'll try to put this in a proper perspective. And this is one of many of um, of uh, uh, Penkai's um, um, uh, questions that he sends me. Fascinating. Uh, so uh, this one is really uh, in, in term. It goes this way: in terms of our future progression and reincarnation. Uh, you seem to have mentioned, and I did this in, in some early work that I did talking about um, when people ask me about dimensions, third dimension, fifth dimension, and all that sort of thing. I, I, I have talked about that a little bit. Um, you mentioned that we are going from a third dimensional consciousness or awareness to a fifth dimensional, and then, uh, but, uh, but how do we go all the way to the twelfth dimension being the highest is the question. Well, what, what I want to kind of remind everybody is, is that we, we are thinking, our, us modern people in, in, uh, in, in the industrialized world are products of the industrial 
uh, environment. We think industrial, it, it's always, especially American, it's always new, better, bigger, um, and that is not necessarily the case uh, the way the, the universe operates in general. It may be how we have operated to get us to a certain level of um, comfort, a certain level of uh, technology and things like that, but that is not the universal model. And so there are, there are channelers and people that keep talking about all these dimensions and always higher, bigger, better. Um, the thing is, well, what's interesting about it is, is that as we evolve, we don't actually go from one dimension to another. We expand our consciousness. Uh, I, I tell people that when I had my near-death experience, the light did not expand my consciousness. But what happened was I was interactive and I tried to expand my consciousness to understand what the light could tell me and what more it could tell me. It was me expanding my consciousness. Uh, I was given no special powers by a near-death experience at all. Um, and so um, as we evolve, we're like this pearl that uh, acquires layers upon layers uh, as we go through experience and, and rising uh, from inorganic to organic consciousness. And so we really don't go up a ladder. We really don't go from one place to the next. What it is, if you can imagine, is we're like the center of this pearl in our experience. And uh, as much as we allow our awareness to open up to other realms is what is happening. It's sort of um, um, like, like being a pearl of consciousness. But here's the thing. Um, how many dimensions do you need? There we get into this mental game that the human upper brain plays. Uh, that upper brain, I call it the star child brain, is always asking these kind of precocious questions, you know. And um, the most important question the, um, the, the, the uh, star child brain can ask at this point really is, mother, how did I get here? We need to, fake, we need to deal with that first, you know, and not jump into un unending dimensions. I've heard as many, oh, just infinite number of dimensions, and who knows. Uh, but but my, my point is, is that how can, you go, how can you do this if you haven't mastered this level? I, I see so many people wanting to skip levels, skip grades, and, and just get this instant gratification of going to Nirvana instantly without doing any work, or or, uh, or their life has been full of suffering or, or whatever, and my life has had a good share of that also. But, but that doesn't in itself enlighten you. That doesn't in, in itself um, uh, mean that you've actually learned anything. Um, so we're here now, and it's time to master this level now. Spending a lot of time and energy on, on other dimensions that would be unrecognizable if, if you were actually in that dimension, you wouldn't even recognize this dimension. Would it be a dimension without physics, a dimension without chemistry? Would it be a dimension of what? You know, what would that be? And so the more time you spend in those, in those um, um, avenues is, is interesting. It's, it's mind candy, but it isn't really about mastering this level. And this level that we're at right now, whatever you want to call it, 3D, where we're, we're in a fourth, we have four dimensions here that we know of for sure. Um, do you know there's a history to the fifth dimension? And most um, people in the uh, New Age movement and higher conscious uh, don't even know there's been a history of the fifth dimension. Um, oddly enough, it started with the age of Aquarius and uh, certain songs that were written and, um, and some of it actually goes back to Blavatsky and people like that, um, you know, in the 1800s. But basically, the modern version of it really got started first uh, in uh, show business, actually, then picked up in popular cu culture by our chambers and things like that. Um, and then there was the group The Fifth Dimension. Uh, this all was very big stuff. I mean, it was very cool stuff if you lived back then, and I did. It was very, very cool stuff. But our popular culture, especially American culture, tends to absorb everything and then produce chop suey. And you know, chop suey is not a Chinese dish at all. It's what we made of the Chinese dish. So, um, so we have to kind of master this level, you know, be here now kind of thing. Although, I write a lot of comedy bits. People don't know that. I write a lot of comedy bits. I quite often pretend I'm on the Jay Leno show. And uh, one thing I wrote was about uh, the baby boomers getting older. And uh, remember uh, back in the um, oh, uh, 80s, 70s, it was Be Here Now, Ram Dass. Be Here Now, Be Here Now. Well, I've got a new one for us baby boomers that are getting a bit older now. And the new saying is, it's Be Where When. I'm confused. It's Be Where When. <laughs> may have noticed some of those changes going on. Um, so um, how does one actually transcend
transcend, and, and transcend doesn't mean go anywhere. Transcend means expand awareness, grow is what it means. Um, uh, but we really, can't, we really are not going to be able to skip grades until we master every grade we're at. And, and there's always this bigger, better, shinier, grass is greener in the other dimension kind of thing going on. But, um, but think of this for a second. To be where you are right now, whether you think it's dysfunctional, whether you think it's successful, whether you think it's what it should be, to be here right now where you are, you have had to literally master every other level to get here. You're already a master in many, many ways. But we, in our industrial mentality, we tend to think we need a new car every year. We need to do dimension every year. And that's not necessarily the case. You are already a master. You've proven your mastery by being here now. And it's beyond intelligence, so when you try to apply strict intelligence to it, there may never be a precise meaning or understanding of that from a purely human intellectual level. So you are already a master. Feel that. Uh, celebrate it. It's incredible what you have gone through to be here now, from inorganic to organic, through all of history to be here now. You're already the master, and we're about to master so much more because at, at every level, we tend to be able to do more and be more than we were before. And, but it's not an industrial model. It's a natural outcome. It is natural growth from cause and effect and experience. So um, that's kind of um, how, how I was uh, told to look at it. I've got another good question here. Um, and um, this one's very interesting. It's from uh, Keiko. And um, one of her questions is, um, what, uh, can you explain the fundamental question, why we reincarnate and what, what is the purpose? Again, that's, uh, that's sort of an industrial, mental, intellectual look at it. Everything must have a purpose. Everything must have a cause. And, um, and it seems that way up to a certain point. Um, but, you know, the, we're, we're living in a, in, a, in a universe that pretty much the ancients have said and, and the light has said to me when I ask this kind of question, we're, we're living in, a, in, in a, a universe where there really was no beginning and there is no end. There are transition states. Call them big bangs, call them birthdays, call them whatever, um, call them Christmas. Uh, there are transition states that we, uh, that we uh, are, have gone through and will be going through. So why reincarnation? Well, as I said in the very first um, uh, part of the series, that reincarnation is the best thing and the most usual thing the entire universe does. Everything, everything from stars reincarnate to make new stars. And not only when stars die, they make new stars, they make the materials that helped us form and come into a consciousness as we know it. So reincarnation is more like, is more natural. It's, um, you, you really can't say, uh, why is a star born? We, 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 uh, we can talk about the chemistry and physics of it, but does there have to actually be a purpose for every single thing before it actually happens? In other words, a pre-purpose. Uh, some people get some comfort out of knowing that, but that would be a predetermined universe if, if, they, if things weren't uh, wide open and free radical in, in many aspects. So, so asking that what is the purpose and why is like asking a flower why it's growing and why it's blooming. Did, uh, was it of universal importance? Um, uh, was a whole universe focused on the meaning of this flower? Um, a Zen Buddhist can do that all day long. But the universe is a very natural outcome. And the amazing thing about humans is that we add the purpose. Uh, it is not necessary for the universe to have a purpose, as we humans may understand it through our intellectual concepts, uh, pre-purpose of everything, that kind of hints of deities and all that sort of thing. And, uh, but it is as natural as a star being born, as natural as a flower blooming. Now, us humans have developed a very interesting form of consciousness um, that uh, may or may not uh, reflect what else is going on in the universe, by the way. Um, there may be many forms of, of intellectual consciousness out there, probably are, but our form
form of consciousness is very interesting as humans, as Gaia, the children of, of Gaia. We are the children of the sun and the moon, I mean the sun and the earth. And um, we, we add purpose to everything that we look at. A beautiful flower that may not have had a pre-purpose, we look at it and we write poems, we take beautiful photos, we do art. This is our gift back. Our, this is our form of consciousness gift back to the universe. We can look at clouds and see many things beautiful. Um, and so uh, uh, we add the purpose to everything. And so if you don't add purpose to anything, it doesn't really have a purpose unless you're a member for a cult or something like that. What this leads us to, though, us adding purpose, is leading us to the thing I talk about quite a bit, the next step is self-initiation. Um, when you realize that you were co-creator of you being here, you were co-creator in the universe being here, you were, you were there through the whole thing, and you were part of it. And, and, and we have manifested in this local part of our universe with this form of consciousness, this form of physics and being. And uh, it is beautiful and should be cherished. Um, our collective intelligence is incredible. And oddly enough, it's taken uh, nearly 8 billion of us to come to this point where we can now have self-initiation. Um, uh, so um, it's, we're, we are so blessed to be here and to be conscious of our evolution um, and to be able to do more, more things than we can ever imagine with what's coming and how our consciousness. But if we don't add meaning to anything, then there is no meaning to it. Um, and so um, this may be disheartening to people that believe that the God out there that knows what every leaf is doing and what every molecule of oxygen is doing, but, um, but that's only, that's just what you need for your own self-comfort. The real excitement here is that we have the purpose. What purpose are we adding here? What, what kind of world do we want? Uh, and the more we get in touch with nature and the rest of Gaia, then we come into a holistic um, a co co-creation. And we're just now coming into that. We're about to mature as a species. We're very we're the, probably the youngest species on planet Earth, and we've been in our childlike state. We're about to come. We're about to mature. And as as a species matures, especially a, a, a a brilliant consciousness like ours matures, we come to a point where we invent a bombs and all that sort of thing. And at this point, it's about justifying our existence. If we don't justify our existence here now, become it by coming to peace and cooperation with the rest of the planet, well then, the planet will do something else. Um, it's not like everything is. Uh, it's not like everything is dependent on us. Remember, in the old days, uh, for thousands of years, people believed the Earth was the center of the universe, and everything revolved around the universe. In fact, a lot of people got in trouble for that. A lot of people got burned at the stake. Uh, Galileo, you know, they only the Catholic Church only forgave Galileo in 1984. Boy, do they hold grudges. Um, but um, but what's happening is, uh, I call it the new Galileo effect. We're, we're having a new Galileo effect now because it's been proven that the Earth is not the center of the universe, but still our, our religions and cosmic conceptions are thousands of years behind in, uh, in where we have actually come to. And so saying that humans are the center of God's eye is like the old world saying the Earth is the center of the universe. If humans are the absolute center of God's eye, I don't know. Anyway, I hope you get what I'm talking about. But the Galileo effect, as we start realizing that, just as uh, it was a big move to say the Earth is not part of, uh, is not the center of the universe. In fact, there are probably many Earths, not just one. Uh, then why would be be the center of a deity's eye at all? So, uh, so we're coming into that level of um, recognition now. I call it the Galileo effect, and it's uh, and it's uh, it's a big stretch for some people. For others of us, you know, we've been ready for a long time. <laughs> We have 
more the more conscious you become, the more direct influence you have. And I'll be I'll be talking about that in some depth um, in a little bit. But but your bad habits can go with you from life to life, can follow you. Your bad habits about money, health, um, um, relationships, all of that can follow you. Um, and I will be getting into this. Um, deeply here in a couple of minutes. So uh, we have a tremendous amount of influence over our, uh, our lives, but only when we become conscious of it. It's like um, when we become conscious of something, it becomes that much more um, easy or able to deal with. Uh, when you're in the dark, you don't even know what's in the room. You're going to bump your head and hurt yourself a lot and, and probably have a lot of drama. But you turn on the light and you go, oh, I get it now. And so, uh, so this is how our opening up to this reincarnation and the near-death uh, subject is, is uh, helping us to evolve. The uh, related question to this is, is very interesting. Um, uh, what about people's interests? Can people's interests give an indication about their past lives? Oh, definitely, very, very definitely. Uh, um, many of you have had uh, experiences like I've had. I was, and this is before I, this is before I knew about reincarnation, and actually before I had my near-death experience back in the um, um, early '70s. Um, I had been in the film business, feature film business, and um, as a cameraman and, and that, but. Um, I attended, I, I was uh, living in Atlanta, Georgia, and I attended a full-blown stained glass art show. I'd never seen one before. And for some reason, it tweaked my interest, and a couple of friends and I went to see this major stained glass show of the modern artists. And uh, it, was, it was amazing. And I remember having this feeling, this is before my near death, or before I knew anything about reincarnation, I remember looking at this stained glass and getting this deep feeling that I know this. I know how to do this. And it was like saying, I remember a past life. And now, I, now since my near-death experience, I, 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 in my past life regressions, I realized that I had indeed been a stained glass artist in Europe and uh, loved it so much. And I, I knew things about glass that were beyond my knowledge things i hadn't even read books on it you know it was uh, my but i knew things about stained glass that um uh, and glass work and and lead caning and and all of that that i there was no way i should have known this but and so i decided to uh, study and I, I i did mentorships with several great of the greats in the world on stained glass and became a stained glass artist myself and along the way um uh, I came up with techniques, I came up with new ways of doing things, and I just took to it so naturally. So yes, um, uh, what our interests in this life can definitely be, um, uh, you know, uh, kind of give us indications of what our interests were in past lives. So another short story uh, about me was that um, uh, I was... Um, uh, I was born into a military family in this life. In fact, my mother married two soldiers, you know, one after the other, not together. But uh, my biological father was in the military when she married him, and my stepfather was in the military when she married him when I was 11. And uh, our family combined has probably been in every war this country's ever had. <laughs> I have, I have uh, nieces and, and things like that in the wars right now over there. And in fact, uh, pretty much in my family, I'm the only male that hasn't been in the military in this life. Interesting, isn't it? So I was my so uh, so when I was getting past life regressions, uh, it, this came up a lot. Military, military, but the form of military that I I was that um, it goes back so far is I was a philosopher warrior, I was a priest warrior, and I always fought for what I believed in and who I believed in. And uh, quite often, uh, misplaced loyalty is really the folly of a wise man. There are many times you believe in people and you fight for them and then you find out, you know, they weren't what you thought they were. But be that as it may, as a, as a philosopher warrior and as a priest warrior, I would uh, go into these holy battles and uh, fight for the side that I believed in. And I had uh, many, many incarnations that way, east and west. Um, and uh, that has been a, one major pattern in my incarnational pattern. And um, there came a day in, a, in 
one of my regressions uh, about this past life and military life. There came a day, and this was back, um, gosh, back in the um, uh, 1600s. Um, I was uh, uh, I was on the battlefield. It was the end of the day, and you didn't fight at night back then. And what you did was the priests would go through the battleground and do the coup de grace to the wounded because if, if uh, you didn't let them suffer. And I remember doing the coup de grace and, and friend and enemy, and they would look in your eyes with thank you. Because if you were left wounded on the field, you were quite often stripped by the camp followers, dogs ate you, and or you died a very uh, a, a horrible death that took, uh, took days sometimes. So it was our form of mercy to go through the field and do the coup de grace quickly, cleanly, and with a prayer. Well, I remember finishing up one day and cleaning my sword, and it was like, uh, this is my past life aggression, it was like um, uh, an angelic voice presence came to me and said, uh, this is the last time. From now on, your sword will be used to, to plow open, to open the hearts of men. And I've never been a soldier since. Um, with a short, very short excursion in World War One as a flyer, very short because I was killed. But other than that, I've not, I've not been a, a warrior of that type. In fact, I'm, I'm proud to say that I am an anti-war veteran. You have so many people saying they're a war veteran. Fine, but I'm an anti-war veteran. And one of the reasons my family disowned me back uh, during the Vietnam War. So, so these past tendencies, so my past tendencies, uh, I, I was born in the military families. I was raised to be military. I was raised to serve my country at least one, one term of service. And um, it was also natural to me. Um, I, I could uh, blindfold and dismantle guns and all sorts of things. As a child, my father would bring them home. He was Green Beret and all that, and uh, probably things you wouldn't do today. But uh, I loved all that. I loved hunting. I loved all of that. In fact, um, in my autobiography, I've written a chapter called The Gorilla in the Room. And um, uh, my father, being uh, early into Vietnam and all that, Green Beret, he would bring home books and we would talk about this thing called guerrilla warfare. And I was so fascinated by it. I thought I was going to follow in my uh, stepfather's footsteps. And that's why I call it The Gorilla in the Room. It was a big deal to me back then. And, and the learning, what my father was learning about, it was fascinating. But, um, but then... Um, that um, angelic voice spoke to me again and said, don't do this, don't go to Vietnam and kill people you don't know, and fall out of political war. So that's just you know, my take on it, and um, not putting down anybody for, for anything else. But you see how these patterns continue, and that's why past life aggression can be very, very um, uh, therapeutic. Uh, it can be very life-changing for you. And now, one last story about this. This is fascinating. I, I have two great friends who I've known uh, since high school, basically. And um, th they, uh, they were married, uh, and um, they, uh, they come from uh, wasp, uh, wasp families, both of them, uh, you know, white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. Um, no hint of anything but white bread in that family, in both of those families. Well, they had this little girl, their first daughter, uh, and I was, you know, I, I was, I was there, and uh, I wasn't there at the birth, but I was, I was there when she was, uh, I was, um, I knew them when she was born. And here's, here's the interesting thing, and, and this is like before I had my near-death experience, because and many of you may have seen things like this, but they had this little girl, and when she began to speak, the first word she ever said very clearly, which shocked them, was oy vey. And she would just keep saying these Jewish phrases. Well, there's, there's, there's no trace of, 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 of any Hebrew people or anything like that in their family tree, both sides. And they were stunned. It was like uh, suddenly she became this little Jewish girl. And uh, it, was, it was quite funny. I mean, where is she getting all this? I mean, they, they didn't even know any Jews at the time. And so fascinating is that, well, she was, uh, as, as I believe now, she's grown up to be a brilliant uh, attorney uh, for world uh, rights and, and ecology. And I believe she was one of those indigo child, actually. But uh, it just goes to show you, um, they had this little Jewish girl born, born in their family. It was fascinating. <clears throat> okay, so... Now, um, we've, we've talked about bad habits, 
value, um, just like in this life. There, you know, there's really no difference between what uh, the physics of this side or the other side, except denser or subtle energies, but there's still the cause and effects and all that going on. Um, but um, learning to change, and, and, and understand this clearly, learning to change your incarnational patterns is very much like promising to go on a diet. You kind of have to work at it and stick with it. For most of us, 99.99% of the planet, uh, it's going to take a little work because pattern. once a pattern gets um, embodied, it's hard to get rid of. It's like you, you spend time running to smoke cigarettes. It takes uh, even greater energy to stop smoking cigarettes. So um, in the simplest metaphor, uh, changing your incarnational patterns is like going on a diet that you're going to stick, stick to and work on if it's worth it to you. And believe me, it is the most worthy thing you can do, honestly. The trick to that, though, is this, um, and we, we all fall off the wagon, so, you know, that happens. But, uh, but basically, um, I do something called do the right thing, and I make a little card for myself, and I list to myself, this is just personal, I list to myself what, in my highest aspect, because we all have a very high aspect uh, among our other aspects, and our highest aspect, what would I be? Would I be, uh, would I have a better diet? Would I, would I take better care of my body? Would I really watch what I think? Uh, um, quite often when I'm talking with people and they're going on and on to me, I'll say, did you hear what you just said? And almost every time they go, no, what did I just say? So uh, we need to pay attention to <laughs> what, we're, what we're doing and what we're saying. Um, and to make this list, and, and make it without any kind of guilty stuff, because, you know, I, I'm not a believer that everybody has to be skinny. There are plenty of, you know, in fact, Gaia's most favorite body type on the planet is the big body. It's survivable. It's beautiful. Um, the uh, uh, skinnier bodies are, take more maintenance, are more fragile. Uh, so the number one body type that Gaia puts out for humans is the big body type. So don't get caught up in all this guilt. You've got to be skinny. That's not required. Um, and I've known many big body people that were very healthy, very active, very light on their feet, and very graceful. So, you know, we've we got to stop buying all this um, uh, fashion magazine stuff. And the other thing is don't make your list based on popular peer pressures. I mean, geez, you know, uh, just sit with it, go to your own heart and think, how, if I wanted to live in my highest aspect, what would I really be doing? Without a guilt trip or anything. Um, not everybody's meant to be a vegetarian. Not everybody's meant to, you know, be a hunter or anything like that. But uh, uh, so, so don't be too judgmental and just go to the uh, core of things. And once you get a new pattern going, let me tell you, once you get the new pattern going, just like a diet and a new lifestyle, it feels really good. It feels um, more real than ever before. So it's very important to understand that. Now, moving on here, um, I want to get into some very specifics now. If you want to change your incarnational pattern, almost the number one thing is forgiveness. Forgiveness is the big one. Um, the, big, the big karma is forgiveness. Uh, um, and as I've said in earlier, uh, earlier um, pieces of this, is that uh, forgiveness is not a woo-woo thing. It's a very real thing, a very healing thing. And um, forgiveness changes your incarnational pattern. But how to forgive and ask for forgiveness when the injured one or the offending party may never even listen to you, hear you, or ever see you again, you've still got to, you, it's still the most important thing you can do. Even if, they're, even if they never see you again, they won't ever listen to you, um, they won't hear you at all. It's so important to go into forgiveness. The number one forgiveness though, that I found, even with myself, because of the way my family was, is that we tend to acquire self-shame for one thing or another. You know, I, I came from the poor end of town. Uh, there were obvious differences. And my, my, I was ashamed of my family. My family was quite an embarrassment to me and uh, made me, and so we all have our, our personal shame. Uh, many of us, maybe not everybody, but I know most of us do something that uh, needs to be forgiven. You need to forgive your shame. Very, very important. Um, 
you need to forgive your pain and quite often the remedy to the pain is to not sedate it or try to get away from it it's to go to your pain and speak with your pain ask your pain the answer is in the pain that you're having whether it be a mental emotional or uh, biological um, and so forgive yourself first for offending others injuring others or for um, whatever you know we, we all make mistakes we all have done things at different points of life and um, and then here's a very important thing to do uh, and always do this in kind of privacy um, uh, this is not something you do on tweet or Facebook um, it's very important to understand that a part of this forgiveness is actually acting as if the person was in the room with you and do this privately you, even, you, if you have a picture of them even better whatever but s speak out loud this has to be done spoken out loud with vibration um, and what you can do is call this person into your presence their image their vibration their memory because memories can be healed also Mem many memories need to be healed and can be um, so you, you call this image in you have a photograph you have something you have an object that maybe you fought over or whatever put that there and speak to it out loud speak to this person as if they're there in the room with you speak to it even if they've never, never wanted to see you again, even if they, they've been rude to you, even if they've been the worst person in the world to you, speak to them clearly, because this is f primarily, first and foremost, for your well-being, and then the well-being of everyone else. So speak to them as if they're really there, and ask for forgiveness, or apologize. And here's what happens. Not only does it there's a clearing that goes on but every time you use the photograph or the name that goes to their vibration we all have these aca threads that kahunas talk about this is sticky stuff it goes and sticks on them it sticks in their aura and they may never even get this message until the day they die and have their life review but this will be played in their life review and at that point i think they'll get it so remember um there is, uh, you can have these conversations with people um, before they die, after they die. You can have it with their memory. You can have it with the real person. And, uh, and even if they're not responsive or listening, this will be, as long as you use their name and know who you're focusing on, this will be played back because everything that's ever been said about you is recorded in your book of life. Everything you've ever said about somebody else is recorded in their life. This is all very, uh, very cool stuff, like the Kahunas talk about all these ACA threads that we attach to each other um, and that can be used. So um, very important to clear negative karma. We don't have to clear good karma, good cause and effects. There's many things we've done that work out well and, and things that we do that work out well. We're only talking, uh, clearing out negative karma, things you feel uncomfortable with, things you, you cannot live with, things that um, uh, offend you, um, that is a kind of karma. And karma is just cause and effect. You know, it's, it's just a, a natural relationship to the universe and to others. Um, we need to clear the negative karma as much as possible. Um, and now, um, uh, and of course that begins with yourself. Now, the, the other thing that's very important here um, uh, is how to prepare. For your, for your next life is, is, is fascinating. Let me get my uh, note here. Oh, here it is. Okay. Um, this is what's very fascinating. I've done lots of work in this field many, many years now. I spent uh, a number of years working on myself with, other, uh, with a couple of other um, um, past life regression therapists to really, you know, kind of find out where I'm coming from, where I've been, and what am I all about? Who am I really? And uh, so I suggest, very, very important, that um, you learn self-hypnosis or you work with a, a hypnotherapist that does past life regression. This is one of the best, fastest ways and most therapeutic ways I've ever found. Uh, that's why I became a, um, a certified clinical hypnotherapist um, specializing in past life regression. Um, it's very, very important that um, you go through this. Uh, I will be, um, 
uh, this course and is, uh, this uh, webinar is moving on to a course that I'm forming, and I will be uh, in, in the not in the near future. I will be training people to do uh, past life regressions the way the light taught me to do it. I want to show people how to do this. I want you to help other people. Here's what I learned, and I'll go into some detail about the um, uh, minutia in a minute. The way that I learned, well, once I'd had past life regressions, once I'd gotten in touch, the light kind of put things together and let me see things as a whole, not as separate. And um, so here's what I would do uh, once I, I hung up my shingle uh, to start doing this work with people. And that is that uh, I've learned that it's not just a joy ride. Just one session isn't going to do it. Uh, so when people wanted sessions with me, they had to sign up for 10 sessions. There could be more, but at least 10 sessions. Uh, and that's for this reason that the light has taught me. And that is that there are three types of progressions that happen. Um, oddly enough, a true past life memory is not the usual. They're there, but they're not the usual. That it's not the, the predominant type of past life regressions that people can have. There are three types, really. There is an actual past life uh, memory that you actually lived. And then there's the uh, all the other stuff you picked up along the way that has formed a memory block of its own, that has formed a personality of its own, that is incorporated into you. So some of the um, uh, regressions are actually um, this layering. And, and uh, I'll, I'll talk about how we filter through that. And then the third type is very interesting, which is uh, not unusual, uh, quite common actually. The third type is a symbolic regression. Um, and how I, what I mean by that is that you, 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 you get hypnotized and you're using the format of a past life regression and then these stories come up that may not have anything at all to do with a past life. Well, keep going because this is the, this is very valuable stuff. It uh, every once in a while, your subconscious, when you're at that state, you're hypnotized, you're very relaxed. Your subconscious will try to speak to you. Your subconscious is always trying to speak to you. We've been told not to talk to that part of ourselves by most of our religions. Um, the best way to learn about that, I feel, is through the uh, Kahunas. My favorite being uh, Serge King. Uh, many of you probably heard me talk about him. Um, so I would recommend his book, Mastering Your Hidden Self by Serge King. Get to know yourself. We are triune beings. We're uh, what you call subconscious, conscious, superconscious, all of that. We're a triune being. And each one of those has a personality or a vibration that's different than the other. And once you get the three in unison, then you're, you're pretty much magical. But so, so there are three types of regressions. Um, and if you practice this, you will learn to recognize them. And why I would have people sign up for 10 sessions is, and, and I would record every session so they could listen to them, because you get a lot more out of it when you listen to it later, actually. Um, but uh, during the 10 sessions, I would keep notes. And during all of the 10 sessions, what was more important to me than, than what type of regression this is was this, and that is the repeated patterns that keep coming up through the 10 sessions on health, wealth, uh, relationships, uh, these sort of things. Uh, no matter if it's a symbolic uh, thing happening, no matter if it's an actual past life memory or if it's just the memory bundles that we carry and have incorporated in us, become part of us. Um, all of that is very, very valuable information. It's all very useful. Don't throw any of it out because in the end, going through all of this, even if it is all actual past life regressions, it's the patterns within those regressions that are invaluable information for understanding yourself. And I've got many, many stories I could tell about people I've worked with for 15 years doing this. Um, uh, fascinating stories. Uh, but all the information is valuable. And if you, uh, if you think you've lived 10,000 lives or whatever, well, you know, let's see. Can I delve into that with an open mind? I, uh, I have one friend of mine who uh, has been to a number of psychic, um, and I would not recommend psychic regressions because that's, that's not clear at all. I have one friend that's been to many, many um, uh, psychics for past life regression. And as it turns out, amazingly, that he's been every famous king there's ever been. From uh, King Tut to King Solomon to right 
on through the present. Interesting, isn't it? Um, so uh, that's the trouble with psychic regressions. Um, the, the story has to come from deep within you. It has to come from the well of your life and your life experience. Uh, and a, a, a good therapist in this field never leads. I've, I've seen books on past life regression, and I see the therapist just leading the client through it. Uh, usually the most I would say is, and what's next? What happens then? Where are you now? I wouldn't tell them to look at anything or do anything. Um, because I think that's coloring it. Uh, it. The story has to be from you. And uh, so that's the three types of regression, uh, of past, past life regressions that are very beneficial. And once you've done a series of them, and it may take more than 10, who knows, it just depends on, on you, but you'll, I find it very, it'd be the, one of the best investments you can put into your life. And find a, find a, a hypnotherapist that you really feel comfortable with or learn uh, or you and some friends can learn hypnosis. It's not that hard to learn and, and practice till you get good at it. Um, but there, there are many ways to do this. But uh, um, that's why I want to start training people to get out there and do this work. And it would be great if we could do this work for each other without charging, wouldn't it? This is just planet work, for God's sake. And uh, that's what I hope it will evolve into. So what's interesting then, uh, to move on, is that um, an important thing, to do is clear the negative karma. Secondly, um, the, the light has told me that um, sometimes people ask, where did the age of miracles go? Was it just in the Bible? The light has said the universe is one giant miracle and we're part of it. And everything that we've ever seen or, or, or heard about, some expert or some shaman at some point said it was impossible. Bumblebees can't fly, all, all this kind of thing. You know, but um, but uh, We've come through that, and so it's so. So the light has told me that the universe is one big miracle. Why they, the miracle ages seem to kind of disappear, except for the fundamentalist, of course, uh, is that modern man, modern industrial man, doesn't take the time and make the space for a miracle to come into you. You have to to make to have miracles in your life. You must take the time and create the space. For miracles to come into your life, and this is uh, affects um, your uh, your uh, next life very importantly. So, one of the things that we're missing is ceremony, ceremony, ceremony. In, in the West, we're missing ceremonies, and it is important to hold. And, and this is when you're trying to plan your next life. Um, first of all, you want to write as many details down about your next life, what you want, as you can remember. And this is the, cre uh, the, the phase. Don't overwrite. Don't overdo it. Write, you know, you can write it and change it and boil it. You've got to boil it down to eventually as many details as you can remember by heart. Because you're not going to be able to take your laptop with you <laughs> when you go. <laughs> and all those notebooks you filled up with scribbling. So you're not going to be able to take that with you. Only what you can remember and keep in your heart. And so... Um, uh, so you must practice, then the one, once you get your story down, and it shouldn't take that long for most people, um, to get, and, and you want to stick to the high, high points are the best. You stick to the high points of what you'd like to do, where you'd like to be, and all that kind of thing in your next life. And then, when you're born into that life, that's when you fill in the details of that life as you live it. You, know, you cannot fill in all the details. Um, uh, it's, it's impossible to do that, but you can. You can set the trajectory. You can set. Uh, you can set exactly what's going to be happening to you. Um, and so that needs to be written down, boiled down to where you can remember your new story by heart. And this should be a joy to you. It, that also gives it so much more energy. And by the way, read this out loud. Almost learn to recite it out loud. This is a, it's like um, if you want a new life, you're going to have to make some changes. If you want a new incarnation, you know, it, it's going to take some preparation. Or you can just throw yourself in the mosh pit of the uh, lower level of reincarnation. I call it the animal level of reincarnation, where you just throw yourself in the mosh pit and you end up where ever your uh, last uh, thoughts and desires were, your un unresolved issues and all that sort of thing. You can clear all this up in this life. And it's important for us, pe people that, like me, are, the, are the, in the peak of the baby boomer thing, it's important that this is the time we should start doing this. In other cultures, 
cultures, they start doing this in their 50s and 60s. It's time to start thinking about these things. Uh, we don't have that in the West. It's very important at our age to start thinking about it. And
and I focused on that part because we did retrieve very, very useful information about cold fusion from from this episode. So you see, there's there's a, you're kind of projecting into the future without a plan. So you're going to this will be very interesting. It, it it may again you go back into the three types. Is it symbolic? Is it an actual progression? There are we are actually living. Um, and multiple potentials simultaneously. And when we focus on that potential, it manifests. Otherwise, all the other potentials are, are uh, in, in the milieu also. So future progression is very interesting. Uh, take it with a grain of salt, though, because uh, unless you plan a life, uh, it's going to be kind of inter- uh, hit and miss. I've had future progressions, and um, uh, oddly enough, um, I connected during one of my progressions to a future self 400 years from now, living in um, living in um, uh, Switzerland. And by then, Switzerland is actually a very warm place. <laughs> it's very comfortable. Um, but um, and uh, so uh, this future self of mine, as it turned out, um, was a, um, a scholar, but also was. Uh, was an emissary to other star systems. And I went, wow, this was an emissary. We will at some point have emissaries and exchange uh, ambassadors and stuff with other star systems. Well, that, I found that so interesting that um, I, can, I have many, many times, and still do, go back to, uh, or go you know, reconnect, not go back, reconnect with that. Uh, uh, I got his name, everything, his, his family, his daughter, and he knows me, I know him. So you can build these kind of interesting relationships that um, uh, you're never going to be able to prove because that's the future and this is now, but I believe there's something real there going on, and I have um, activated a, a, uh, a very serious potential self that I'm kind of aiming at, actually. So uh, these are things we can get into uh, extreme details about, but it's almost a case-by-case thing. It isn't like every future uh, progression that you see and experience is actually going to happen. Some may, some may not. It's uh, it's that quantum physics thing again. But uh, fascinating, and I think very useful. Inventions, knowledge, information, very useful. Very, very useful, although I don't get too um, literal about some of these things. Um, and so um, uh, one thing I am doing, and, and, uh, and I want to help uh, people get into this idea, is how can we prove... Uh, in the future that reincarnation is real. How can we show up in the next life and prove to people we were that person? Isn't that an interesting um, mind experiment? Well, I've been thinking about this for many years and, and coming up with different scenarios to set up in this life so that when I am reincarnated, I can go to a certain place and, you know, uh, you can have time capsules, you can have secret codes, you can have a Swiss bank account that's accumulated a couple hundred years of interest while you were, uh, while you were uh, in, in non, non-time and space. Um, and so uh, we will be talking about this in, in the, in the uh, 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 fourth and fifth of, of these uh, talks. Um, and that is, um, can, can we do something that we can prove and plan for? And, of course, you're going to have to remember it uh, and actually prove it to people. I think so. I think why not. There's a lot of things that we could do where uh, you 400 years, 100 years, uh, you know, from now we can pretty much guarantee certain places are still going to be there and certain things will still be there. But it is an interesting mind thought in, in how can you uh, set yourself up. When I was a child, um, I was, I've always been a kind of a poet. When I was a child, um, I used to write poems to myself, but I was writing them to myself as an adult. I wanted my adult self to someday realize what this child had gone through. I just had this thought, and I wrote a lot of poems, which I put in a little metal box, and a lot of poems um, uh, to my uh, future self, which was my adult self, and I never wanted uh, my adult self to forget what this child felt, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and um, and that that became very precious stuff later on, very, very precious stuff. It's uh, sort of what happened when I, you know, I caught the hippie movement just right. I'm just perfectly right, and I was one of the early people to let your hair grow. My hair got down to my waist. People didn't know men's hair could grow that long, and uh, so I caught that hippie move, and it was quite a, quite a great ride, um, uh, but the disco came in, and all the rednecks and everybody had long hair all of a sudden. When I grew hair, it meant something. I could be pulled off the street quite often by police just because I had hair, And um, uh, but, uh, but once disco hit... <laughs> There's no point anymore. So I, uh, I went and had my ponytail cut off, and I said, I'm going to save my 
my ponytail so that one day when I have children and they ever say I'm square, I'm going to get this ponytail I'm going to wave it at them. <laughs> I remember what it's like not to be square. So um, fascinating how we can have fun with life like that. So, um, so with, with these kind of future uh, lives, we can set up time capsules, we can set up legacies. I, I really believe uh, Swiss banks are still going to be here for quite a while to come and other institutions. Um, and so there, there's a great mind experiment. Um, uh, you know, MIT uh, has started this um, time traveling um, um, convention they have every year. And they got permission from um, some of the great libraries to take these uh, non-acid cards. They, they had an invitation printed um, on you know, archival uh, paper and everything. And, it was, uh, and they put them in certain books around the world that if you were a time traveler and you visited the library, you would probably look up one of these books and you would find this invitation to come to MIT on, on certain dates, you know, every year or whatever, and uh, show up. Well, uh, so far they haven't had one show up yet, but I thought, what a fascinating idea. What would a time traveler be looking for? Where would they go first? Uh, I don't think they would uh, just pop into the middle of uh, Fifth Avenue you know, and go shopping. But um, So these are kind of interesting mind experiments that I think are, are multi-life and multi um incarnational experiments. Now the other thing about incarnation to remember is that with our industrial mentality, we we think we've got to be so busy and we've got to do everything now. You know the old phrase, you only have one life to live. Um, but realize that most of the most of the things you really want to get done in life and in planet work are going to be multi incarnational. You can't get everything done in one incarnation. You just can't. So don't get uptight about it. Um, be smart and take a few things, even one thing that you want to work on consistently in this life uh, to ho hopefully make a difference. Even one thing, if you're consistent with it, will make a difference. Don't feel like you have to save the whole world and correct all the problems of humanity in one incarnation. That's just a little too much pressure. So, uh, so uh, some of uh, I know some of my work has I now realize after my near death has been multi incarnational work that I've actually been doing through intent and through heart without even a, a modern intellectual um, uh, reckoning of it. I just these are things I want to do. I get in my heart when I die, and there are certain things I've been working on for uh, several incarnations and uh, getting closer and closer. By the way, doing what I can. So. Um, so that's, uh, I'm going to wrap it up here in about a minute. So it's very important when you play this tape back, I think you'll get a lot of information out of it. Um, and I look forward to your next questions. Um, so I'd like to read uh, another poem by the ancient poet Mellon. Um, and this one's called The Clear Way. It goes like this. In the super material universe where, where all is God's stuff, and God is being busy, being God in every way imaginable, and in every way unimaginable. The dense and subtle light darkness of our gods spin, play, as worlds, spirits, realms, and nuclear karma. Remember this, dear one, as you begin to ascend. The darkest darkness created the lightest light of creation, and light in the material universe will always create shadows. Call it karma, cause and effect, degeneration and regeneration. They are equal opposites in co-creation. It is the yin and the yang of things. It is the surrender and the force of will. The balance of infinite order and infinite chaos is the key. Being clear is the way to master the key. Remember this, dear one. Remember this now as ever and now more than ever. Be clear with all things and the universe surrenders to you. You, the self-realized, universal shaman. Anyway, it's been a blast and I look forward to the next one. Um, so thank you all so very much and may the light of life bless you in all ways and always. Thank you so much.